Well, it's great to be together here. Thank you, Roy and Augie, for an awesome worship. And uh, as you were singing those songs, I was like, man, those go like perfectly with the lesson today. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you did that, so thank you. Um, but it is, it feels like I haven't been at church in a long time. Uh, it's so good to be back. A couple weeks ago, uh, we had COVID, so we're officially the safest family to be around. So you can hug us today. Um, and then last week, we were at our daughter's graduation. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But uh, it's just great to be back. And it's good to see family members visiting. And uh, it's just uh, sometimes it takes a little time away to realize how much you really appreciate uh, being together. So hopefully, you feel that today. Uh, I have a couple of pictures from our my, this, it's, the sermon's called Heart's Desire. It's from Romans 9 and 10, and I'm sure these are the two chapters that whenever you don't know what to read, you read them, right? I'm sure I could, there's probably like two people in here that even know what's in these chapters, so uh, it took a while to kind of get the hang of it, because these aren't like the home run chapters. Last time we did the Hall of Fame of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, I mean, when you ever don't know what to read, like Romans 8 is like the chapter to read. And if you, don't, if you don't know about, if you read that one yesterday and you don't know what to read tomorrow, then you read Romans 12. I mean, those are kind of like the two big boys in the book of Romans. And uh, so it was fun to go through uh, Romans 9 and 10, but kind of before we start, I'm going to catch you up on our, a few pictures here. Uh, there's Manny. <coughs> and... Um, <coughs> And Monica, and uh, it's just such a cool story how Manny brought Monica out, and then Monica brought Manny back. And so it's just like you know, some good teamwork there with the sister-brother uh, combo there. And uh, just appreciate you, man. We had a lot of fun. We went out camping a couple weeks ago, and Manny has just really given his whole heart to the friendships. And I, I got to thank Cal and, and his group, the Sexual Integrity Group. I mean, just... They've been really brothers to one another, and it's just obvious and so uh, encouraging there. So, um, and Mikhail and, and everybody who is in on the studies, Johnny and everyone. Um, <clears throat> here's our picture. That was my favorite picture. That was Chloe and her freshman roommate. They met like the very first, first day of college and roomed together for the three years, and just we got so close to their family. And uh, she was the one person that Chloe said was actually louder than her. <clears throat> I'm not so sure, but at least she felt that way. Uh, but I love that picture. We had a, uh, it was really a cool time to uh, be a part of that. Sharing good news from the Middle East. Thank you so much for everybody who gave uh, last week. As a, our three churches, three sister churches, we gave $188,000 last week. So give yourself a hand for that. And uh, I know that we're still going, and uh, we'll get to our goal of 250, but, man, that was just such amazing. Uh, so thank you so much for your sacrifice and your love. And I just got this this week that you can't see it, but he sent a picture of the church building there that they are just so excited about because, as I told you, it helps them to get all the churches in the Middle East legal. So they just got the, the roof on, and now they're getting it to the inside. And, uh, and then in Egypt, they were uh, sharing good news that they had three people coming back to God uh, this week. And that's a church of only about 60, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, they are doing great. Some of you got to be online with them a couple Wednesdays ago. and It's just cool to be able to connect, and this is really my communication with them, right? Like, they send me this, I send it back, we send voice messages, we talk on the phone every once in a while, so... It's, uh, it's really cool. So I'm going to try to start do better with passing these on to you guys so you know what's going on. <clears throat> okay, Romans 9. Let's, uh, let's say a prayer, and then we will we'll jump right in. Uh, Father, we do thank you for this time. Uh, thank you so much for the church here and just their love for you, uh, their love for our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, just their sacrifice for one another, uh, just in, in dances, cars, gifts, uh, and just prayers, God. I know that uh, you have blessed us so much. Help us to pass that on to uh, our friends, family, and this world. God, I pray that you open up our hearts 
and really get the most out of these two chapters in the book of Romans. God, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to start reading in verse 1 of chapter 9. Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. And we just talked about the Holy Spirit last time. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. That's probably the most challenging sentence in the entire New Testament. That he would be in such anguish for his people that he would be willing to, I think it's figurative, but he was that passionate that, man, I'll give up everything for these people. I love them that deeply. And, you know, even now as you think about your own life, there's probably somebody in your life that you have some anguish for, some, some angst, some concern that they're not going where they need to be going for God, you know, and just we're struggling. And that's kind of where Paul was here. He says, theirs is their adoption to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. He's basically saying, man, they, they had everything, but they messed it up. It was so easy for them, but they turned away. You can imagine Paul, as he got baptized, thinking, man, I am the perfect messenger for the Jews. I mean, he was trained under Gamaliel. He had all the education. He knew where everyone was coming from. And it, for a few weeks, he got to live that out. And then God said, no, nope, that's not your plan. That's not my plan for you. Maybe we've lived that, right? We figure, oh, when we get baptized, and the, we're, like, we're going to just convert our whole families, and all of our friends are going to just love this. This is the perfect thing. And sometimes God says, no, nope, that's not going to happen. Sometimes it does, but Paul is adapting to where God is putting him, and he's basically calling the church in Rome to also adapt to what God is doing. You know, and I want just even say a prayer as you think about those people that have caused you anguish. Whenever you think about them, if you could just pray, that will make a big difference. Even here, my theme... I like to look for themes for chapters because I try to make it easy for myself, try to make it easy for you. These two chapters, my theme is right here. <clears throat> Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you could put the Lord Jesus in there. It would probably be better because he's basically saying they didn't respond to Christ. They wanted the law. They wanted the legalism. They didn't want freedom. They didn't want to break away. They didn't want to be persecuted. They wanted to do it. The safe way, not the Jesus way. They wanted to be in control. They didn't want to give it up to Christ. I mean, as we were singing that song, I go up the mountain. I'm just thinking, man, that's exactly what God wants us to do. Instead of trying to control and hold on to everything, he wants us to let it go and trust him. And that's why whenever you think, of, whenever you're challenged this week, if you could just think of that word, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Or just say the name Jesus. Whenever you're struggling, just say the name Jesus to yourself. And put your, as you're putting your trust in him, you're calling on him for help. There's no one that ever cried out to Christ that got turned away. There's a lot of people that got turned away that never cried out to Christ. So say the name Jesus as you struggle, as you're in anguish, even as you're happy to give him praise. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. My first point is the desire for trust. <clears throat> Anybody ever played the trust game, right, where you fall backwards? Yeah. Anybody ever played it from the top of a yeah. truck or something? I never did that. That looks, that's like the super trust game right there. <laughs> we're not going to demonstrate. Don't worry. We're not going to have you, you know, stand on the podium. We're going to catch you. No, that's, that's, that's a little much. Maybe 10 years ago, that would have been a good idea. <clears throat> But God, the whole, a lot of this chapter, he's getting them to trust God's plan. 
Even when you don't like it, when you don't understand it, when it doesn't make sense, trust God's plan. That word, the word trust is the same thing as faith. Have faith in God's plan. Know that he has got your back. He's got your front. He's got you covered in the past, as Roy said, and in the future. Amen. Trust God. Not an easy thing to do, but have faith that he can do anything in your life. He can, and he gives them four different examples in this chapter of trusting God. Trusting God when they didn't understand, when they didn't like it, when they tried to do it their own way. And he's basically trying to get them to accept that not all Israel is God's people. Just because they were born there doesn't mean that they're God's people. That's the whole point of this chapter and a lot of point of the whole book of Romans, that you got to have faith in the name of Jesus. And so he goes through Isaac. He says, it is not as though God's word failed. For not all are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because, are, because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who were regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated, at the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. And so he's basically saying, think about Abraham. It made no sense what, I, what he did. He showed up to a 75-year-old man and said, you're going to have a child. And Abraham's like, that's pretty hard to believe, Jesus. And he's telling us in those situations in our life when we don't know what's going to happen, he's saying, I got that covered too. And with a year left, he said, I will come back in a year and Sarah will have a son. And they both laughed and we know the story. But he's reminding them to trust God. Don't try to do it your own way like Ishmael, like he did. He tried to take it into his own hands. He tried to make up a different way instead of just trusting God even when it didn't make sense, even when he didn't like it, he was called to trust God. Even That's what God is calling from us. Trust him, even when you don't understand. Maybe you feel like you understand. Even if you feel like you understand one thing, there's probably 20,000 things that you don't understand. Trusting God is really the goal of our lives. And then he talks about Jacob and Esau. <clears throat> This one's a little more challenging. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What do you do with that? <laughs> what are you supposed to do with that passage? Before they even did anything, God said, well, the younger one is going to be greater than the older one. And then later on, Malachi says, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. In talking about God's judgment on those who didn't believe in Christ. Obviously, Jacob and Esau didn't believe in Christ because Christ wasn't there yet, but he's relating that same thing because they didn't believe. And yet, that's a challenging thing. Do I trust God's plan even when it doesn't make sense? Because God says that he's good. That's not the question. The question is, do you trust that? God said that he's fair and he's just. God's not the one on trial. It's, do, do you believe that? Of course, he gave Jacob and Esau a lot of opportunities, etc., and he was fair and everything. But Jacob wasn't the greatest person either, was he? He was a deceiver. He wasn't transformed until the very end of his life. That's encouraging. God can use anyone. Whatever we, our flaws are, but for his reason, he chose Jacob 
rather than Esau. If God would have chose Esau instead of Jacob, I think he could have done that too. But he didn't. He chose Jacob. Do you trust, even when it doesn't make sense? And then Pharaoh. <clears throat> we don't think much about Pharaoh, right, because we think about Moses. But what about Pharaoh? Let's, let's see what he says here. He says, what shall I say then? Is God unjust? It's about justice. Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but God's mercy. He says that a bunch of times. Because they were a people that wanted to depend on their own effort. He said, for scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he ha wants to have mercy and harden whom he wants to harden. If you think about the story of the Exodus without Pharaoh, it wouldn't have been that great. If it was just like, oh, he just asked one time and then they left, like, that's cool. But because Pharaoh became so obstinate and so harsh and so mean and so evil, it just showed God's power more and more and more. And that, that's what all the nations in the promised land were talking about, of what God did in Egypt. Not just because it was one thing, but it was seven different things that he was making his name known through Moses, but also through Pharaoh. And then he continues on here. I don't have this slide for this, but he says, one of you will say, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a mere human being, to talk back to God? For what is form, shall what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does the potter not have the right to make out of the same lump of pottery clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? That God is the one who's making us. We're not making him. We're not telling him how it should go. He's the one who's telling us how it's going to go. And he wants us to trust that plan. In the next chapter, he says... Everyone who says Jesus is Lord and believes in him will be saved. And yet we want to be in charge. We want to be the one calling the shots, right? We want our prayers to just line right up and we determine exactly our life until we get to heaven. And he's like, are you the clay or are you the potter? Are you the Jesus or is that, is that him? And he's, he's kind of, he is rebuking them here, and it's good for us to recognize that God's got a better plan than ours. That is so easy to say. I said that in Kids' Kingdom today. I love Angie Larson. She's one of the most faithful sisters in the world. She is way more faithful than I'll ever be. She's been through so many things. The first thing out of her mouth was that, man, I've been getting my, I've been on dialysis three days a week now for years. I just said, man, it's, it's easy to say when you, that's not you. You know, it's easy to say when everything goes well. But trusting God that even in a sinful world and with that's, fallen, that he's going to work his magic and his miracles through the love of him and his people. That's not easy to do. I'm not up here telling you it's easy. Because it might be really easy today, but tomorrow it might not be. I look around and I see people who have trusted God through some really, really big things. God is so proud of you for that. That was the whole idea. That was the whole point. And finally, he uses Israel. What if God, although cho choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, 
prepared for destruction. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, which he prepared in advance for glory? Even us whom he called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. That's one of our favorite verses in the kingdom study. And I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the children of the living God. And that's a little bit confusing when you read all that. But I love this part because it shows Paul wrestling with what, thinking about the question, what is God doing? Why is God doing this? What was his plan? What was his point? Not trying to direct it, but just trying to see it. What if God showed his patience with these evil people for so long to show the people that have loved him his mercy? Say, man, if God could be so patient with the emperor of Rome, how patient is he with us? How much will he put, go through on our behalf? If he gave them so many chances, how many, how many chances is he going to give us? How much grace does he give us? As he starts chapter 10, he kind of concludes this section, but it kind of is the same. In verse 1, he says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they do not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Just keep looking to Jesus. Keep crying out to him. He will provide, even when we don't understand, that we can fully trust him with our lives. That he wants to bless you, that he loves you, that he's taking care of you, that he's got your back. Will you trust Jesus today? Will you decide to trust Jesus? Will you look for God's plan even when you don't see it? Can you imagine Abraham, as he was going through those 25 years, thinking to himself, I wonder what God is going to do with all of this struggle. I wonder what kind of victory is going to come out of this. Or Moses, when he's getting so frustrated and he's out in the wilderness, thinking like, what is God going to do with my life? And we see what God did with his life. And think about your own life. Whatever that struggle is, what is God going to do with your life? How is he going to use that as a testimony? How is he going to use that for his glory? I look forward to seeing that. And there's a lot of miracles right here, even as I look around. My last point, desire for faith in Jesus. Again, it's pretty much the same thing as having trust in Jesus. In Romans 10, he says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, what I mentioned earlier, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, it is with your mouth that you profess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. I love that verse. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame even though it may feel like we get put to shame. But in the end, we won't. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He goes through the next chapter, the rest of the chapter 10, you can read it. And he chooses like five or six verses that basically shows that God wanted the Gentiles all along. 
that he wanted the whole world, that it wasn't just about his people, it was really for the whole world, that it wasn't an afterthought. Basically, that's kind of God flexing. Saying, I said I was going to do this, and I'm doing it. I told you a thousand years ago I was going to do this, and I'm, it's happening. This wasn't just like a, an accident. I'm not just throwing it all together here. Like it's, This was all part of the plan. You're the ones that aren't getting it. The plan is still true. The plan for Jesus to be the end of the law and to be the end of their faith. It says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's an Old Testament verse that he's basically saying, yes, you're bringing good news to the Gentiles. That's what this verse was about. It was in there all along. You just thought it was about yourself. You know, my heart and my prayer is that we will have more of that heart. That all the God's promises are not just for us. That it's not just to keep them in here. That we're, the, we're supposed to bring the good news to the world. We're, our, our job isn't just to trust God in our own lives. It's to help others trust God and be the light of the world and be the salt and be all those things. And to have a heart, like Paul said, where he was willing to be cut off for Christ for someone. That's why that verse is challenging. When was the last time you felt like you were ready to be cut off for Christ for someone? When was the last time that you had a heart and you a passion for those outside of these walls? And I know a lot of people, we have that. A lot of people, we, we had that. That's like a past tense. That's like a chapter. And my call for myself and for all of us is to bring the good news. Have a passion for those that haven't found that trust in Christ. As Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. I gave them so many chances. Now I'm going to those that aren't even looking for me until they're ready. And chapter 11, we're going to do that in a family group one time, but it basically says that God still has a plan for the Israelites, but at that point it was, it was shut down because they were hard and they were unfaithful regarding Christ. As we take communion today, I want you to recommit to trusting Jesus in your life, to having faith in him, and to bringing good news to the world, to one another and to the world, to pray that God will, simple prayers, just leave me today, God. Help me to cross paths with someone that needs me, needs you, needs a word of encouragement, needs a connection, needs hope, needs what we have through the Spirit. Amen? I thought of this verse from Jesus. Do not, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moss and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. And we've heard this verse in connection with giving and not being connected to worldly and earthly things, which I think is probably what it's about. But in this chapter, the treasure is Jesus. Amen. Put your treasure more and more into him. Commit your life more and more into him. Decide, I'm going to trust him. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted him. 
even decide today, I'm going to trust Jesus. I'm going to give him a chance. And he won't let you down. It says the eye is the lamp of the body. That perspective that God is with us. That Jesus is in control. That he has a better plan for our lives. If I could just see it. If I could just see it in the way that God does. And I pray that that is our prayer as we take our communion together. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time where these chapters show that uh, people there, were they struggled, Father. They, they wrestled with these things that they couldn't understand. And yet you kept calling them back to Jesus. You kept calling them back to your son. I pray that today, whatever's going on in our lives, that we can reaffirm our faith in him, that we can make him our treasure more and more, that we can have eyes that see not just things in front of us, but see heavenly things, see spiritual things, see the way that you're trying to work, the way you want to be glorified in our lives and those around us. God, thank you for this time as we remember Jesus, the body, his body and blood that were broken and shed for us, that we can lay down our lives for you, that we can trust you, that we can, even as Manny did this week, reaffirm that you are the Lord of our lives. God, help us to not close you off, but open ourselves up to you at this time. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name.